Good evening and welcome back to the Dove Church Bible Study. Last time we started looking at Revelation 4 and 5, the scene of God's throne room, which is central to the to the whole book of Revelation. And in particular, we looked at the worship that begins around God's throne with the four living creatures constantly crying, holy, 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 and then expands outwards in concentric circles to embrace by the end of chapter 5 every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them the whole of creation is constantly praising and worshipping God and it does this by the very fact of its existence um, in arrogance we may refuse to accept the sovereignty of God and of his anointed one but our very breath utters praise to him as Paul writes to the Philippians Philippians um, 2 10 and 11 every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father we also looked at the rainbow and how it takes us back to God's covenant with Noah in Genesis 9 uh, how, how the lion, the ox, the man and the eagle are, are reflected. These, these four orders of creation that are saved through the flood um, are reflected in the four living creatures that praise God around his throne. So right at the beginning of the book of Revelation, which perhaps we um, more often associate with the revealing of judgments and curses, God seems to be saying, OK, look at this rainbow. Remember the promise of hope and redemption that it gives. I haven't forgotten it either. This time I want to uh, explore a couple uh, more aspects of this dense, multi-layered narrative. Uh, John describes what he sees in, in, in God's throne room he draws on images from Isaiah 6 um, and from the early chapters of Ezekiel um, and most vividly I think from Daniel chapter 7. John never directly quotes Old Testament sources but he alludes to them he picks up images and pieces of description words spoken all the characters present and he reapplies them to his new context the parallels that we see in these passages are clear yet there are also important differences it's as if God never reveals himself in the same way but in each vision he gives some fresh insight of himself and builds on what has been given before so we'll spend a bit of time exploring some of these things but first let's pray father in heaven author and finisher of our faith, creator of all things, beginning and ending, Lord God Almighty. We look to you, along with everything you've made, we worship you. We take the little we've gained in our lives, and with the elders around the throne, we lay it before you. Everything we have and everything we could aspire to be comes from you, it's your gift and here we are again seeking to learn a little of you as we approach your scriptures your book so please teach us lord instruct us in your way so that we'll be able to see you more clearly to love you more dearly and to follow you more nearly in jesus precious name amen Again, we're going to read the whole of Revelation 4 and 5 and then confine most of our comments to chapter 4. So, Revelation 4, 1 to 11, I'm reading from the NIV um, anglicized version. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I'll show you what must take place after this. Once I was in the spirit and there before me was the throne in heaven, with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones and seated on them were twenty-four elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. 
From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were burning. These are the seven spirits of God. Also, in front of the throne was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In its centre around the throne were four living creatures. They were covered with eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third had the face of a man, and the fourth was a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings, day and night. They never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives for ever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives for ever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. Chapter 5 Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll, with writing on both sides sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside then one of the elders said to me do not weep see the line of the tribe of judah the root of david has triumphed and he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals then i saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain standing at the center of the throne encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The Lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense which are the prayers of God's people and they sang a new song saying you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and your blood and with your blood you purchased to God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth and I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. A question to get us started. What words would you use to describe the heavenly scene in this passage? What words would you use to describe the heavenly scene in this passage? And why would you choose those particular words? What difference does it make how we describe this scene? What difference does it make how we describe this scene? Another question. 
behind our everyday struggles and challenges we face, the very mundane and the utterly terrifying, there stands this heavenly throne room where God's creator and Lord remains sovereign. How does this vision help you to understand your present circumstances? How does this vision help you to understand your present circumstances? So one of the prominent features of this chapter are these four living creatures that surround the throne and appear to lead or to inspire um, the worship of the whole court of heaven. First the elders and then the, the angels and then every creature. We meet uh, similar creatures elsewhere in the scriptures. We encounter them in Isaiah 6 as the seraphim and elsewhere, notably in Ezekiel 1 as the cherubim. So let's remind ourselves. So Revelation 4, um, second half of 6 to verse 8. In the centre, around the throne, were four living creatures. And they were covered with eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had the face of a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. It was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. And day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Here... Four living creatures are in the centre around the throne. The Greek says in the midst of the throne and circling the throne. So it's hard to picture that. So they must be intimately close to God, to his person and to his sovereignty. Although they have wings, they don't appear to fly in this case. But they declare the holiness and the eternal nature of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So, some questions on these creatures. What do you make of these living creatures, God's throne guardians? What do you make of these living creatures, God's throne guardians? <laughs> Try to picture in your head these four living creatures as described here how successful are you in doing so so the most obvious uh, connection here as we look into the scriptures um, is with Isaiah 6 1 to 3 a um, very well known passage in the year that King Isaiah died I saw the Lord high and exalted seated on a throne the train of his robe th uh, filled the temple above him were seraphim each with six wings with two wings they covered their faces with two they covered their feet and with two they were flying, they were calling um, to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. So in both of these visions, the one in Revelation and the one in Isaiah, God is in his temple on a throne. In Revelation, John sees this throne as in heaven. Verse 2. In Isaiah's vision, the Lord is in heaven on earth, as it were. His temple is in Jerusalem. But it's a place where heavenly things are happening. It's, it, if you like, it's where heaven touches earth. The Lord is in a, a high place, as a, a place like a place of government or, or, or of judgment. And, and here also, he, he's surrounded by these these strange living creatures in, in Revelation 4. But there's 
uh, an indeterminate number in Isaiah, we aren't told. But these also have six wings. And, and while they use four to, to, to cover themselves, uh, they also use two to fly. And they do nothing but proclaim the Lord's holiness. In Revelation, they inspire the 24 elders with their worship, verses uh, 9 and 10. And then the whole court of heaven. And, and when the whole of creation is caught up in this hymn of praise, they they come back with Amen. It's at the end of verse five of chapter 5, verse 14. But in Isaiah, they shout to one another, urging each other on. The rest of the heavenly court is not seen. Uh, but its presence is implied, but it's... At this, at this point, anyway, it's invisible. Their testimony is to Isaiah and to his fellow humans, perhaps, as they they are singing about the whole earth. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. It's a heavenly song, but it's about the earth. Perhaps this is like the creatures in Revelation saying Amen when the whole of heaven and earth join in praise and worship. So another prominent feature of these living creatures is their eyes. Revelation 4, 6 and 8 says in the centre around the throne were four living creatures and they were covered with eyes in front and behind each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around even under its wings. What do we make of these eyes so a question twice in verses 6 and 8 John tells us that his creatures are covered with eyes what do you make of these eyes what do you make of these eyes Eyes. The, the Greek word is ophthalmon. Uh, the word can refer to the physical organs and to the sense of sight, but also to a person's attention, as in hidden from your eyes, um, or to their presence, as in before your eyes. Um, it might be to do with a person's desire of the lust of the eyes perhaps or uh, and eyes can also express emotion and feeling it's a strange image to be sure it's hard to comprehend but i think a couple of things are probably true these creatures exist to direct glory to god and to declare his holiness to define and to protect his holy space the presence of god um the the covering wings in exodus 25 um, um guarding the tree of life in genesis 3 uh, and and these eyes support that function that they're, they're instruments of these creatures worship Eyes are sometimes said to be the windows of the soul. Uh, and these creatures in their worship are, are continuously conscious of the presence and the beauty of God in his immediate presence. They constantly drink in and soak up all God is. They are alert. They are unceasingly vigilant nothing escapes their perpetual scrutiny so eyes maybe to do with wisdom maybe to do with understanding maybe to do with knowledge there's a connection here with ezekiel's vision which we will we, we'll come to in a few moments he has eyes in his vision too while Isaiah sees the Lord on his throne in Jerusalem, 
A hundred years or so later, both Ezekiel and Daniel are exiled from Jerusalem in Babylon, where, whereas Isaiah sees the Lord at home, so to speak, in, in, in Jerusalem, they see him on the move. And this explains some of the differences between their visions and Isaiah's. So in Daniel's vision, Daniel um, 7, first half of verse 9, it says thrones were set in place and the ancient of days took his seat. And it sounds as if this is going to be a temporary arrangement. The, the thrones are set in place. Um, and we see that the ancient of days in the in the, the, the last bit of verse 9 has wheels on his throne. It's like a chariot or a carriage of some kind. A mobile courtroom is being described we get this in Ezekiel's vision too but there the description is much more elaborate and altogether stranger and the whole thing that Ezekiel sees is in constant motion in Ezekiel 10 we see the glory of God rising into the air and flying away from the temple in Jerusalem and we suppose this is how he's able to appear to Ezekiel in Babylon don't forget that in the Old Testament, God is associated with the place, with the land and the city and the temple. And that while there is a sense that he is omnipresent, the, 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 the seraphim sing, the whole earth is full of his glory. He was to be worshipped in Jerusalem. They weren't supposed to build altars anywhere else. And this might also explain why Isaiah sees seraphim, but Ezekiel sees cherubim. The word seraph means burning. It's sometimes used in the Hebrew scriptures to describe serpents. And there seems to be a cultural link here with Egypt, where, where similar images are used, which would fit with Judah at the time of Isaiah, which was more oriented towards Egypt and against Babylon, cherub, on the other hand, is the Babylonian word, meaning one who blesses. And the cherubim were the guardians of sacred places. And this is what the seraphim are also doing in Isaiah 6. Both of these creatures are associated with fire. The word seraph is to do with fire. And the cherubim and Ezekiel sees are also associated with fire. They're both in the business of blessing the the the, the seraphim cry, cry out holy 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 um, so the cherubim and seraphim are different words different concepts perhaps for the same creatures and these seem to be the same as the living creatures in revelation 4 so we've got living creatures in Revelation 4, seraphim in Isaiah 6, and cherubim in Ezekiel 1 and 10, and also elsewhere, which we'll, we'll look at in a minute. So, a question. What do cherubim and seraphim actually do? What do the cherubim and the seraphim actually do? And the first time we see cherubim in the Bible, as, we, as we've mentioned before, actually, is guarding the way to the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.24. And the next time we encounter them, it, it's on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus 25, covering the presence of God with their wings. Uh, they are an important component of the presence of God. Psalm 80 verse 1 says this, You who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth. God's space, his presence, is defined by these creatures. Exodus 25, 18 to 20 says, Make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Make one cherub on one end and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherub or make the cherubim of one piece with the cover at the two 
ends, the cherubim are to have their wings spread upwards and overshadowing the cover between them. The cherubim are to face each other, looking towards the cover. These cherubim appear to be human in form and only have two wings, as do the two cherubim that stood inside the inner sanctuary of Solomon's temple. So 1 Kings six twenty three to 27. For the inner sanctuary, he made a pair of cherubim out of olive wood, ten cubits high. One wing of the first cherub was five cubits long, and the other wing five cubits, ten cubits from wingtip to wingtip. The second cherub also measured ten cubits, for the two cherubims were identical in size and shape. The height of each cherub was ten cubits. He placed the cherubim inside the innermost room of the temple with their wings spread out. The wing of one cherub touched the wall, while the wing of the other touched the other wall, and their wings touched each other in the middle of the room. Now Ezekiel's uh, cherubim are altogether stranger. And there isn't time here to do, to do the, his descriptions justice. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to pull out some details for comparison we really need to read the whole of ezekiel chapter one and and maybe some other chapters in ezekiel two but we're not going to do that so the scene's very different ezekiel is a priest who's been exiled to babylon from jerusalem so he's familiar with temples and the idea of the presence of god and with his cherubim and he sees God in what seems to be an elaborate throne chariot. So Ezekiel 1, uh, verses 14 to 13, I'm just going to take some verses out of this. Uh, I looked and I saw a violent storm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning surrounded by brilliant light. The centre of the fire looked like glowing metal. And the fire was what... And in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. All four of them had faces and wings. The wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a human being. And on the right side, each of the face of a lion. On the left side, the face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. Each one went straight ahead. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go without turning as they went. The appearance of the living creatures was like burning coals of fire or like torches. In Isaiah's vision and also in Revelation, these living creatures surround the throne and shout praise to God. But here they seem to be carrying God's throne, which has wheels in verse 15 and is mobile. So imagine this as, as something like the Levites carrying the ark of the presence of God on its journey through the wilderness in in. Ezekiel's vision, the cherubim are carrying God's throne um, so that he can be among his people in Babylon. He will be on the move until a new temple is made and consecrated for him. As in Revelation, there are four creatures comprising a lion, an ox, a man and an eagle. The same orders of creation as in Revelation based on Genesis 9. Uh, but unlike in John's vision in Revelation, the in appearance their form was human. And also in Ezekiel's vision, each individual cherub manifests all four creatures. Um, so that is hard to imagine. The number four is clearly important. Four creatures, each with four wings, with four faces moving in four directions and, and although its significance isn't very clear it it might be to do with the four cardinal directions that orientate everything in space north south east and west um, and the creatures appear from the north and they face in four directions verse 17 but always move straight ahead without turning 
Um, they have wings that touched each other, as in Solomon's temple. And they also cover their bodies, as in Isaiah. And although the whole <laughs> contraption has wheels, verse 19, when the living creatures move, the wheels beside them moved. And when the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose their wings made a sound like a roar of rushing waters, like a voice of the Almighty. And there isn't clear that they used them for flight, as we might expect. In fact, it's really, really hard to see what's going on in this image. It is perplexing. And we were talking about the eyes uh, that covered the living creatures in Revelation. And, and there is a clear link here. Ezekiel's vision continues, uh, verses 15 to 18. As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each living creature with its four faces. Uh, this was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparkled like topaz. All four looked alike. They appeared to be made like a, a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions as the, feature, as the creatures faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome. And all four rims were full of eyes all around. So Ezekiel's living creatures <laughs> each has a wheel, or perhaps a, a, a wheel inter intersecting a wheel. Verse 16. And, and here is the wheels, or, or, or the rims in particular, that are full of eyes all around, which, which, if anything, is even harder to visualise than John's vision in Revelation. You can imagine living creatures having eyes, but wheels. Wheels with eyes. And Ezekiel goes on to describe what he sees above these living creatures with their, with, with their wheel arrangements. Um, so Ezekiel 1, 22 to 26 spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked something like a vault sparkling like crystal and awesome under the vault their wings were, were stretched out one towards another and each had two wings covering its body when the creatures moved the sound of their wings was like the roar of rushing waters like the voice of the almighty like the tumult of an army when they stood still they lowered their wings then there came a voice from above the vaults, over their heads, as they stood with lowered wings. But the vaults over their heads was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli. And high above on the throne was the figure like that of a man. This is God's throne chariot, supported by these winged creatures and their wheels as it flies in the sky. So Michael Heiser makes an interesting connection, pointing out that eyes are, are bright, gleaming things, and that these, wire, these wheels effectively rotate in the heavens. What's being described by Ezekiel are constellations of stars. He says this, The wheels within wheels is a way of symbolically describing the stars, the constellations, in their courses. Stars and constellations mark time. The messaging of Ezekiel 1 has a very specific aim. Ezekiel's vision proclaims to the captives from Judah exiled in Babylon that the heavenly king who, con who controls the cycles of time and history is not Marduk, the chief deity of Babylon at the time, but Yahweh of Israel. That's from the Naked Bible podcast. Um, episode 366 and John is re referencing this by giving his living creatures eyes that he sees them with eyes it, it's a reference back to Ezekiel's vision although the arrangement is different and the eyes appear on the creatures and not on wheels there's no wheels God doesn't need wheels in Revelation he's at home in his temple He's also writing to people who are exiled, who have seen the temple of God destroyed. Although his description of these living creatures is different, this is his vision. 
message here is much the same. And Michael Heiser continues, God is in control of time and history. He and his council are about to make that quite clear as they render judgment throughout the rest of the book of Revelation. That's from the same podcast. So question is to think about that. These eyes are very hard to understand. In fact, they defy our understanding. I've shared some ideas here, but what do you think? These eyes are very hard to understand. In fact, they defy our understanding. I've shared some ideas here, but what do you think? A couple of other good thoughts from David Guzik. These living creatures of great intelligence and understanding live their existence to worship God. All failure to truly worship is rooted in a lack of seeing and understanding. The way these super intelligent beings worship God reminds us that our worship must be intelligent. He quotes from Trap. Our service must not be rash, but reasonable, Romans 12, 1. Uh, such as, wherefore we can render a reason. God hates a blind sacrifice, a Samaritan service, where men worship they know not what, nor why, John four twenty two. That's from the Blue Letter Bible uh, website. And this is uh, a good way to uh, segue into Daniel's vision. While the ongoing theme of Revelation 4 and 5 is, is the praise and worship of God, this, this council is convened to enact judgment. Daniel 7 acts like a kind of a prelude to the main action of the book of Revelation. It's a courtroom scene set like the passage we are currently reading in the throne room of God. Although, as we mentioned before, it's a kind of mobile throne throne room. Daniel, who, like John, is a prophet, has a vision in which he sees four great beasts rising up from out of a churning sea the, these are like the antithesis of the beasts of the of the living creatures around the throne remember also that in the beginning darkness was over the face of the deep so these these great beasts rise up out of a churning sea these beasts are all fearsome and predatory and the effect is deeply disturbing to daniel but as we read on in daniel 7 his dream is partially interpreted within itself daniel seven fifteen to 18 i daniel was troubled in spirit and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me i approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of all this so he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kings who will arise from the earth. But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. So, pro tip. If you find yourself in the middle of a perplexing prophetic dream, ask someone what's going on. And the answer here is sweet. Chaos and mayhem, but then victory and peace forever. Yes, forever and ever. Which is really revelation in a nutshell. The fourth of these beasts is especially formidable. Verse 7. After that, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. And this beast is the object of divine judgment. Um, verse 11b. 
I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. This beast has ten horns and also a little horn that is boastful before God and, and was waging war against the holy people and defeating them. Okay, a little horn <laughs> waging war against God's holy people and defeating them. So, okay, that stretches the imagination too. Horns in prophecy have a couple of different meanings which are really to do with strength and warfare. They, they often stand for kings or military or political powers. Uh, think of the horns of a ram or an ox that enable those animals to inflict damage and to be dangerous. In the ancient world, uh, animal horns were also used as trumpets to summon people to battle. So you can see how a horn can be said to be boastful. This fourth beast represents an empire that will devour the whole earth, verse 23. And of course, the temptation is to try to identify it, uh, the beast itself, with the, with the ten kings who will come from this kingdom, verse 24. But this is not a very fruitful exercise because we can manipulate whatever political situation we happen to find ourselves in to fit the prophecy. Is it the Romans or the Ottomans or Genghis Khan or the Nazis or communist Russia? There have been plenty of candidates throughout history. It's enough to know that these ferocious empires, these beasts who oppress God's people will be destroyed in the end. And the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. So question, is there benefit in trying to understand current world events through biblical prophecy? Is there benefit in trying to understand current world events through biblical prophecy? So the central part of Daniel 7 is where Daniel sees God in his courtroom. Daniel 7, 9 to 11. As I looked, thrones were set in place. The Ancient of the Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. God, here he's called the Ancient of Days, sits on a fiery throne in the midst of these other thrones and passes judgment on this boastful and arrogant beast who really has no situational awareness doesn't get what's happening let's have a look at revelation 4 2 to 5 there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it and the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. There were thrones in heaven. God is sitting as the president of his heavenly council. He's surrounded by his entourage, by his court, and in front of God's throne, and, and surrounding it is fire. Fire that stands for judgment. Um, see, perhaps, Amos 7, 4, Matthew 5, 22, Hebrews 10, 27, 2 Peter 3, 7, and, and also stands for, for purification. See also uh, Psalm 66, 10, uh, Proverbs seventeen three, Isaiah forty eight ten, Malachi three five, one Peter, one seven. 
Daniel's vision began with the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Um, Daniel 7, 2. It's violence gives rise to these violent beasts that dominate the earth. John's vision also has a sea, but it's flat, calm and clear as crystal, a sea of glass. Instead of chaos beasts rising from it, John's vision has these four living creatures, these guardians of the throne who perpetually sing praise to God and are full of vigilance full of intelligence and understanding so in john's throne room vision in revelation um he's drawing richly from these three earlier prophetic visions in ezekiel um in isaiah's vision in jerusalem the year that king Isaiah died in isaiah 6 uh, from ezekiel's strange and, and, and powerful vision of God's throne in uh, Ezekiel chapter 1 and, and Dan, Daniel's prophetic vision in Daniel 7. These are clear, par there are clear parallels to um, each of these. But the structure of this scene, both in its contents and its narrative, are, are, are more rooted um, in Daniel, but still distinct and different. But here also we are in a courtroom it's a judgment seat uh, scene but who or what is being judged revelation 5 will make this uh, a little clearer and we'll look at that next time but daniel's beasts uh, especially the fourth beast with its boastful horn have not been forgotten its final place is to be slain destroyed and thrown into this blazing fire so whatever specific pronouncements Revelation 5 will bring forward, we can expect one of the themes of Revelation as we go forward to be the execution of this judgment that's been pronounced in Daniel 7. The destruction of this evil empire, this beast with its boastful horn, and the vindication of these holy people of God who were its victims. So a couple of questions to finish with. Consider the impression left by this chapter in the context of the seven letters to the churches that we've read recently. What is your response to John's description of what he sees here? What purpose does this chapter serve? What is your response to John's description of what he sees here? the court in in heaven the, the rainbow the living creatures the fire the, the 24 elders on their thrones in white with crowns and this is expanding circles of praise and worship that encompass the whole earth what purpose does this chapter serve what purpose does this chapter serve Human beings are, are given the ability to think about things and to gain understanding at least a little bit. How can we be more deliberate in allowing our understanding to inform our praise and worship? How can we be more deliberate in allowing our understanding to inform our praise and worship? I'd like to say that that's it for chapter four, but we haven't really talked about the elders yet who surround God's throne and they clearly have an important part to play um, and we should talk about them. So I think we'll start with them next time and we'll also um, start to consider chapter five as well. So see you then.